September 1991. You could see that nobody, no Ethiopians knew about that. I have all the studies which have been studied, made in, under this institution. $10 million was the budget of contradiction and because they are pastoralist or nomad or there is a contradiction between Somalis and among Somalis and so so no. It was planned, designed through the intelligence service and through their organization they have created to divide the people. This must be clearly known to the people. Then sociologically we can speak. There is no plan for the country. The plan for the country is in the beginning was use all the resources of Ethiopia and build it Tigray. But that it had failed. All the structures they have built in Ethiopia, all the industry in Tigray, they have built in Tigray, today are functioning under capacity. And who is pampering them for that? It is the U.S. who is pampering them. United States, in the time of Clinton, later on on the time of Obama, especially Anthony Lake, have divided Africa into four anchor states. Egypt, was designed for the whole Horn of Africa, for the whole of uh, Northern Africa. Ethiopia was nominated as an anchor state, and through Ethiopia they will influence the region. So in that way they were giving, pampering them, knowing this minority regime have no basis within Ethiopia. It doesn't even represent the people of Tigray. Today Ethiopia is 100 million. What they did, the OPDO on the Oromos, taking the land from the Oromos, giving it to the to, to, to the Netherlands uh, uh, company, which have destroyed ecologically producing uh, flowers. Uh, do, do you know that one flower? Uh, Dr. Mohamed. Yes. Dr. Mohamed, so yes. l- l- let me just put one question to you. Um, yeah. Given the position that, that you are taking on, on this particular question, assume that Ethiopia is a federal state and a democratic state, and the federation is based on, um, on, on ethnicity or uh, nationalities, uh, peoples, and so on and so forth, as it is now. Would you anticipate a conflict over land, for example, under a democratic context between um, between various ethnic groups, various nations and nationalities? One of the major principles of a democratic state is a discussion between the different communities and bringing a, a progressive, and a democratic resolution among the communities. Mm. But if the regime in Ethiopia is based itself by divide and rule and creating contradiction in order to survive, you cannot expect from such kind of state there will be any stability. The stability for them, it frightens them because they are a minority. The more there is stability in the country, the more that the bigger communities come into agreement to themselves, then it is they panic because they cannot continue the normal the business of them. So they have to create every time a contradiction. If there is no even contradiction, they have to invent it in order to maintain the hegemony of the state power. That is the major logic we have to understand. Assume that Ethiopia is a real federal state. And when we, the, the only organ which, which represents the federal state, it is the parliament, which is, means The Oromos will have different political parties. Freely, they can elect their own leaders, and they can come and they go to election and they can uh, 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 come to the parliament. Amhara is the same, Somalia is the same, and all other Ethiopian people. Then the parliament will be legitimate to discuss what kind of arrangement and what kind of new Ethiopia have to be built. But now, we don't have that situation. The constitution is a paper tiger. And it is put in also that even the secession, it is not a secession for Oromos, it is not a secession for Somalis, it is a secession they were preparing for themselves, which became now in a limbo. So this state is an apartheid state, dominated by a minority clique. That is what we have to explain to the international community. Even the international okay. community are saying that. All mm-hmm. journalists now who have been aware, international uh, journals are writing Ethiopia have nothing to do with democracy. It is a Bantustan, which is not different from the Afrikaners regime. Okay. Um, Abadir, I, I, I want to come to you because there are a couple of uh, issues that Dr. Mohammed uh, raised as, as a point of disagreement. What, what's, what would be your response to that? Um, well, I'm not sure if we necessarily disagree. I think we... Um, That's what I mean. 
based on what he said, uh, I would say that we agree on most of um, most of his conclusions. Um, maybe there are small differences as to emphasis. Um, and uh, what I was trying to emphasize is that, uh, you know, okay, our main difference based on what he said, and, and I won't be able to give you a point for point uh, response, uh, but our main difference is um, I, I, I don't think that the Ethiopian government is as all-encompassing and powerful as uh, was presented. Um, I think the Ethiopian government is, you know, um, is much weaker. Yes, it, it designs policies. For example, I definitely agree that it's, you know, uh, the, the, the Ethiopian constitution itself was designed by the TPLF to rule the country and everything, everything within Ethiopia or every time you hear Ethiopian constitution, um, it, it comes from uh, a point of view of does it serve a ruling party or not. And, and I agree in that respect. But however, I don't think um, they are able to create, you know, ethnic identities, invent uh, political parties that don't have, uh, you know, local actors with, with their own agency. And there's always going to be agency on the part of the, you know, OPDO and agency on the part of the DU police. And they're going to have their own interests, you know, and um, and so um, I don't give them as much credence, you know, not every success and failure in, in Ethiopia is eventually going to be directly caused by them. Although the Ethiopian government is a significant actor, it's acting within a specific context, interacting with uh, local actors, regional actors, and we should look at those contexts rather than just looking at everything from the point of view of what is the EPRDF doing. That's my main uh, disagreement. And uh, with regards to, for example, you know, India and Nigeria were raised as examples. I mean, these are Nigeria, for example, is a society with tremendous amount of uh, ethnic competition and conflict, inter-religious, inter-ethnic ethnic uh, competitions and conflicts. So, um, you know, I, 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 what I'm trying to say is we should put some more nuance into our analysis and look at, uh, let's not ignore the role of local actors. That, okay. That's basically our main disagreement. Okay. Um, thanks for that, uh, Abadir. Uh, before I move to our second issue, uh, I want to come to you, uh, Professor Mohammed. Um, one of the key points that has that has come up so far is, is the idea that um, the existing structure is uh, undemocratic or anti-democratic in order for the minority region to thrive and, and continue in power. Uh, it is important that they uh, uh, not only use existing fault lines, but also they have to invent these fault lines uh, at times. Uh, so from that point of view, the kind of conflict that we see uh, in the border region between uh, Romia and, and uh, the Somali region are basically artificial conflicts that are that were created and generated uh, by the center, not so much uh, by people in the region. But we also know that the center in this particular case is not acting independently. It is acting through the new police and the regional government. So we cannot sort of um, you know, discount the agency of the regional government because it is actually doing uh, doing something, although it is on behalf of other other forces. The question that I wanted to put to you is that: Can we say that the the the, the system of divide and rule would actually work if there wasn't some basis that makes it useful for for TPLF? If there wasn't, for example, ethnic based uh, rivalry? Uh, conflicts or uh, historical grievances between the various uh, elements making up the Ethiopian Empire in the past, would this policy actually work? Uh, yes. Um, the idea of agency that was raised is a good one, but agency really within an extremely limited uh, role 
I had uh, a good fortune of intervie uh, interviewing uh, the two previous presidents of Oromia who barely escaped with their lives from that country. And on the basis of what I heard from their voices, it is just impossible. You know, without mentioning name, one of the president told me there was a hunger in El Babur areas. The Oromos who were resettled re in El Babur areas, they did not have uh, access to resources. And then uh, there is a foreign uh, uh, aid that is given. And he could not travel from Addis Ababa to El Babur to distribute that grain without getting permission from the TPLF leaders, basically. A president of the regional state cannot travel within Oromia itself without getting permission from the TPLF uh, 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 leaders itself. Basically, the TPLF leaders, I'm not exaggerating, really, they could imprison, they kill, they could uh, exile, they could do anything, even to the government officials in Oromia, in Somalia. If you heard earlier, uh, Dr. Muhammad said the, uh, the regional government in Somalia was changed 38 times. Uh, uh, Muhammad, correct me if uh, I heard you clearly. Yes. Yes, uh, this is within a period from probably 1992 to uh, uh, 2010. After 2010, the story is different. Imagine within uh, from 2000, uh, for, uh, 1994 to 2010, 38 government you know, leaders. Some of them are in exile. One of those is actually a longtime personal friend of my, mine, and he was my director when I was teaching at Teacher Training Institute in Jimma, Hussein Smile. And he served under Haile Selassie's government. He served under the Derg. Ultimately, he escaped with his life from the Jiga because someone informed him it was by 15 minutes. These are his words, actually, that he escaped with his life from Jiga and then went into exile, uh, basically. The point I'm really trying to say is the TPLF, although it's a minority government, their, their security apparatus is so huge, they control everything. Anyone who goes against them, they either, of course, uh, the system corrupts leaders, and those who are corrupted, they have to work with them. Otherwise, they will expose, imprison, kill them, do all kinds of things. Uh, I, uh, the point I am really trying to, uh, to uh, mention is the TPLF basically rules through its security apparatus, probably a very huge apparatus with which they frighten and then force uh, uh, corrupt individuals to simply do their bidding. I'm not sure if I answered your question. <clears throat> no, no, you, you absolutely did. Um, uh, may I add something on, the, on what Professor Muhammad said? A very brief point. Very brief point. The person I'm talking about is a friend of Professor Muhammad. That person is Dr. Abdul Majin Hussein. Who shot him? Abdul Majid Hussein was shot by the intelligence service of Uyana for a simple reason that there was a demonstration in the Ridawa that the Somalis demanded certain rights and he was a chairman of the League Party. After that demonstration in 72 hours, they have shot him. I have all the evidence and the witnesses. And he died because of that. The country is ruled, as Professor Mohammed said, through the intelligence service. The intelligence service is so huge, had infiltrated every segment of the so-called OPDOs and all other organizations, and they even create organizations. This is what I, just to add for the information. 
I think that that point is very well made. That TP-Link, through its security agents, dominates every aspect of social and political life in that country. That none of the regional governments have an autonomy of their own. That they are given very specific instructions uh, um, by the central government, mainly uh, by TP-Link. Um, and, and can we conclude from this conversation? Can we conclude that the current disputes, conflict between the two regions are not conflicts between the Somali and the Oromo people, but rather um, a conflict that is instigated, aided and abated uh, by uh, the central government. Uh, Abadir. Uh, yes, I, I, I actually um, would even say that, uh, you know, the Current conflict is by no means, uh, can by no means be interpreted as a conflict between the Somali uh, and the Roma people. Um, and, and I think the narrative we should be fighting against is um, a narrative that tries to interpret, that tries to expand these conflicts. You know, when I say these conflicts, I'm talking uh, specifically about the the ones that um, you wanted to talk about, the ones that are taking place currently. If those are blown out of proportion and interpreted as a conflict between Somalis and Oromos, um, I, which they're not, if it if if it were successfully interpreted that way, that would that would make this conflict much bigger and would give the government what it needs right now, which is respite uh, from um, its own problems. Mm. I think one of the reasons I wanted to clarify this point by in some cases taking the position of a devil is, is precisely because there are different types of arguments that are circulating on the social media, which is the platform par excellence for uh, engagement and, and debate for uh, uh, Ethiopian communities. Uh, one of the arguments that I heard, for example, is that the current conflict is essentially an extension of the greater Somalia dream that has been around for a very long time. So, so there were very uh, conflicting interpretations and articulations of what the conflict is. And I think it is important that we explore different angles uh, of this debate. So I think I can assume very safely uh, that this panel um, agrees that this is not a conflict between the population of the two regions, but rather uh, a conflict that is artificially manufactured by the center uh, in order to secure the existing arrangements of power uh, in the country at the moment. Uh, Dr. Awal, may I add one footnote? Yes. I am, again, not exaggerating to say the Wayanis will never want to see a viable Somali state. They want to keep Somalia utterly in turmoil, and they have been doing this since 1992 up to now. It is really basically going on. And what they use, the idea, the point you mentioned about Greater Somalia, is basically for propaganda purposes. The, the, how would I say, they are manufacturing conflict that does not exist. Conflict is traditionally existed between pastoralists, between pastoralists and the farmers, and then within the farming community itself. Mm -hmm. But they have through centuries managed to solve these problems. Now this conflict cannot be solved because the government created a special force, trained, well-armed, which they unleash not only on the Oromo, but on the Somalis themselves. Probably the Somali people are the greatest victims of, uh, Dr. Mohammed knows this much more than me. And, and uh, if we talk about the creation of the EU police, Definitely, there will be a lot of points we could clearly clarify. 
Exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the EU police in a minute, but can I just ask you one other question, Professor Mohammed? Um, you know, although this is not a conflict between the two communities per se, uh, there was a conflict and it has been having impacts on the local population, particularly those living along the border. And I heard you uh, speak at one, in, in one occasion about uh, this conflict and you were drawing on a personal experience about um, a place that used to be part of the Somali, part of the Oromia region, now placed uh, under uh, the Somali region. Uh, can, can you tell our, our viewers what that story is and how this dispute, which is artificially manufactured, is actually having an impact on the fabric of society on the ground? Oh, I mentioned several places on July 8th at the Oromia Support Group Conference in London. I basically talked about the Liu police and it is a terror. It is terrorizing the Somali population, not only in uh, the Somali regional state, but in Somalia itself. Uh, and then in the Oromo areas. And since 2014, the TPLF definitely, especially with the uh, Oromo protest, and there is a clear evidence. Let me mention one point. You know, from 2007, when the Liu police was formed, up to 2013, the Liu police numbered only uh, from 10 to 15,000. From uh, 2014 to 2016, it expanded to almost 45,000 uh, uh, force. What brought about this threefold increase within such a short time? Uh, basically, my observation is really based on two things. One, the TPLF start leaders started using the Liu police for it is war against Al Shabaab in Somalia itself. And they were fighting in Somalia itself. And then with the Oromo protest movement, they started using them for the purpose of terrorizing. And the point I mentioned earlier, they attacked Kumbi, they ad attacked Gursum, Midagalola, Mayu, and Bordrade. These are all areas I personally know, but the most important one is Kumbi. That was where my late mother was born and may her soul rest in peace. And as a young boy, I traveled actually with my father to that area, and it is the farming and then pastoralist communities who live in that areas. And of course, the Somalis will come for trade and so on. But around Kumbi, when I was there, unless memory fails me, it was a long time ago, it was the Oromo population who inhabit. Once the Liu police attacked the area, they attacked suddenly. Remember, they have formidable military force, a heavy uh, uh, machine guns, and the local people were utterly disarmed. I'm not exaggerating. They were utterly disarmed. They even cannot carry a spear, cannot carry manja, cannot really carry any weapon. When they were suddenly attacked, people, men and women and children, they suddenly fled from the area. Guess what the TPLF force did? They intervened in the name of making peace. And then once the communities that fled from that area were not allowed to return, remember their life Everything they owned were simply gone, basically, exposing them to hunger, to poverty, and so on. What the uh, TPLF force will do is encourage the Liu police to plant the Somali regional flag and then start a rudimentary you know, administrative. What they wanted was to embitter feelings between the Somalis and the Oromo. Basically, they are really trying to turn them against enemies. People who are related, people who have lived for centuries as neighbors are now turning against each other. And this is, in a word, this is uh, a, a TPLF manufactured 
you know, uh, conflict really, deliberately manufactured com conflict. And if I may just add, I will stop, I may add, uh, some of you who read Oromo history may know about Madewalabu, which in Oromo cosmology really plays an extremely important role. Almost all important Oromo institutions, pe traditionally people assume, develop if it did not start there, definitely consolidated themselves at Madawalabu. Today, the Somali regional flag plays at an area that is regarded at the core, at the center, at the heart of, of Oromo tradition. Uh, and what is the implication behind that? They basically want to plant long-lasting enmity between the Somalis and the Oromo. And the Wayanis, they definitely know what they are doing, and uh, it is really to turn people against each other for a long time to come, and our people should never fall into the trap of the TPLF. I'm mm. sorry for taking too much time. Uh, thank you for uh, for that very personal account. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you are you are familiar with the region. You were a former uh, diplomat of the Ethiopian government. Uh, you certainly know a lot about the region and also uh, the workings of the federal government. I wanted to ask you specifically about the social impact of this artificially manufactured conflict. What impact did this conflict had on the local population in the Somali regional government? The impact. Before we go to the impact, Again, I come back to the nature of the state. Uh, why I'm coming back to the nature of the state? If this state was a democratic, all this problem will not happen. When the TPLF have declared it is war against Eritrea, 30 Tigrayans, seven Politburo members, and 23 Central Committee members, they met in Bahardar. They have never informed the OPDO, they have never informed the Amharas, and they have never informed of the southern people. They discussed among themselves and they declared the war in Eritrea. After they declared the war, they created a work, a work uh, council and they brought it to the rubber stamp parliament. You cannot, if you are an independent sovereign nation and state, to wage a war by segregating the majority of the population and their representative. And only 30 people have waged a war, just to give you the psyche of the regime. Other point I wanted to make clear for you. When the Islamic court have defeated the warlords in Somalia. Dr. Mohammed, we'll, we'll, I, I will come to that point. I, I'm sorry, I have to stop here. I will come to that point. We'll talk about the EU police and the politics around the EU police and create these points when we do that. Can you just, for our audience, tell us what impact at the level of uh, society, uh, at the local level, this conflict it, has had? It will have an impact in a sense it was designed to tie the Oromo uprise and to divert it into Somali-Oromo conflict. That is the political objective. They don't care whether Somalis die or Oromos die. Anyway, they were dying also before. Divert the uprising of Oromos. And that is, and then you bring a Somali-Oromo contradiction. Then they can have, they can relax and continue their design for the future division and make sure that the Oromo Renaissance cannot be born. They are trying to make an abortion of the new Oromo child, which is in the womb of the Oromo, o Oromo nation, which is bringing a new renaissance in the Oromo uh, population. The younger population of your generation have rejected to live like a slave in their own country. They have organized, the Kairos organized in one day, uh, by invisible way, 2,000 villages and cities in Oromia have protested without, uh, despite the regime have its own intelligence, police, army, and so on. So this new evolution threatened the basis of the minority regime. What you will do if you are part of them? How you can divert such kind of a tsunami which is coming 
directly toward them. The only way you can do that, you have to ignite a conflict between Somalis and Oromos. While the two victims, they can be busy fighting in something which is not theirs, and then the regime can revive and show that it is it have a control in the country. And then, of course, he will go to those who are pampering it, that it is Ethiopia is in a, it is going to collapse. Without us, there is no way Ethiopia can survive. Oromos and Somalis, they will cut their throat each other. Amharas and Somalis, they will, Amharas and Oromos, they will kill each other. And, and so on and so on. They are selling to, their, to those who are pampering them. I have been their diplomat. Can, I, can, I, can I just come in at, at this point? Do, do you think this, this narrative the government has been using for the last 25 years has somewhat worked? Well, the government, when you say that there is a government on the day and there is the minority government on the night, which one you are uh, defining a government? Those let's, who just, are the let's, let's just assume yeah. that we are talking about the de facto government led by the TPLF under the name of EPRD. Yeah. Well, this, this ones, this ones, there is nobody with them except themselves, and they make their meeting in the night among themselves. They don't constitute more than 30 and 40 people themselves. My question, uh, my, uh, my question Dr. Mohamed, my question is, yeah. do you think they have achieved their goal in terms of this conflict and advancing this agenda? Have they succeeded? They, they didn't succeed. They will try to succeed. Okay. That is their major job. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to turn to the second uh, part of our discussion, which is around the Liu police and the impact uh, the Liu police uh, has had uh, on uh, this particular uh, dispute between uh, the two regions, but also the role the EU police is playing more broadly in Ethiopian politics. So the first question I want to ask, about it, I want to put this to you. Uh, what, what was what were the political considerations behind uh, creating the EU police? Who created it? Why was it created? And what were what were some of the discussions uh, around the time in which it was created? Well, um, my understanding of the EU police is that. Um, it it was it morphed into existence as part of the Ethiopian um, security forces campaign in the Ogaden region, and I wouldn't be able to tell you. This is not something I've done. I've researched specifically, so I wouldn't be able to give you uh, the specific this the, uh, discussions that were taking place within the Ethiopian government or within the uh, Somali regional state. But what, what it looks like is that. Uh, when the Ethiopian government first came into the Somali region, the, the Ethiopian army was always in the Somali region. And this is something we need to understand. Um, Oromia region, yes, definitely. But the Somali region, uh, the Ethiopian army had a big role in running the Somali region. And when we talk about, you know, 30-something presidents being changed in the Somali region, it has it has a specific context in which the the military, not just the federal uh, government, not just the administrative part of the, the Ethiopian regime, but the military itself had a big role uh, in, in how the region was administered. And so the formation of the Liu police, uh, I believe, has to do with um, the Ethiopian army coming into the Ogaden uh, campaign, uh, the, the, the campaign against the ONLF, and slowly bringing about, um, you know, it, when it first came in, it used local administrators, local people as its translators, because what they were doing was uh, basically an anti-insurgency campaign that that necessarily um, had war crimes, the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity as its, you know, uh, as part of the, the campaign, as part of the uh, uh, counterinsurgency tactic uh, techniques, and um, when they first came in, they did have local people who are doing their translation. You know, you wouldn't be able to come into a village and tell the people that they will be killed if they don't leave their village in uh, 24 hours or three days, unless you have local people translating for you. Um, and and I think um, the Liu police, I. I I think the Liu police is basically uh, local people who are recruited into the military and trained in the military in this process and eventually given 
uh, independent operational, um, uh, you know, operational independence in implementing this counterinsurgency themselves. Um, so I would give it somewhere between 2007 and uh, 2009 would be the, you know, the metamorphosis. But around 2009, uh, you start hearing of the Liu police committing atrocities uh, rather than the Ethiopian military. So I think they're a force that was uh, trained by the Ethiopian military and eventually given operational uh, independence uh, around 2009. Okay. Um, Dr. Mohammed in, in Belgium, um, this is probably one of the most prominent counterinsurgency force um, recruited um, and, and given, um, as Abadir was saying, um, uh, operational independence uh, to operate within the Ethiopian state, uh, the most vicious, uh, very cruel force uh, that has no qualms in terms of using all types of violent, uh, violent methods. Um, let me just um, quote uh, what Human Rights Watch said in terms of um, how this force came into being. Uh, Ethiopian authorities, this is quote, Ethiopian authorities created the Liu police for the Somali region in 2007 when an armed conflict between the insurgent Ogaden National Liberation Front and the Ogaden and the government escalated. By 2008, the Liu police had become a prominent counterinsurgency force recruited and led by then regional security chief Abdi Mohammed Omar, known as Abdi Ili. Abdi Ili became the president of Somali regional state in 2010, and the Liu police continued to report to him. Now, as you said, there was about 38 different presidents uh, since 1991 um, for that region. Uh, this is probably the most stable and the longest administration that ever existed because it has been uh, in operation since 2010. Now, the question is, would you agree with this characterization of the legal police's uh, origin uh, and and what it is today? First of all, Wayani went to loot the, the resources, which is... Uh, known long time ago, discovered in this part of the world, in this part of Ethiopia. They have looted and, uh, the Oromo resources. They did what worse than what has happened in, 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 in the Somali area. The counterinsurgency plan, it was not planned and it was not uh, uh, organized in the beginning by the Wayani. Wayani is not able to organize a counterinsurgency. Counter, the counterinsurgency which created the Liu police, subsidized and given money and training, is by the British. From the British Development Fund, 18 million pound was given to this project. They collected young people, they brought them to Hurso, and the trainers were, uh, they were British, which they have an expertise on that. They did it in different parts of the world. They did it also in Ireland. So a counter uh, 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 insurgency campaign. But in normal circumstance, if you have an insurgency against you and, and you plan a counter insurgency policy, counter insurgency policy have four components. One of the components is that you try to win the heart and the mind of the majority of the population and isolate as much as possible the insurgent, which is, means you will have a second project component, you will have a program to build a project, a water for the local people, win the population you reside. You must have a political tool. It's not only a military tool in order to fight the insurgency. But this insurgency is a very specific and special. It's an absolutely the destruction of the population and removing the population from a very strategic place which they consider there is a very big concentration of gas and petrol, particularly in a certain areas. And a specific attacking and a specific Somali clan on that area and chase away the, the, the nomads who are living in that area. The Liu police is not new. The Ethiopian state in the past, in alliance with Israel, have Israel created for Ethiopia two important paratroop uh, uh, in Ethiopia. One, it's what they call Fatno Darash, professor's nose. This is was trained by the Israelis, a rapid force which is supposed to uh, go into Oromo area, particularly in Bali, 
and 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 in Borana and 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 certain area of the Somali area because of the constant revolt which happened in 1960s, early 60s and late 60s. The other is that it is commandees. Commandees is a special troop who have been created from the Eritrean population, from the highland, and are supposed to fight against the insurgency in Eritrea, killing young people with wires. In thousands, they were killing them and hanging them in Asmara, burning villages, raping women, and so and so on. What is happening now in the Somali area and the creation of the Liu police? You need to have two special characters. One, somebody psychologically disturbed who hates his population extremely. He has been always associated with Ethiopian troops, especially in the military camps in the time of Mangistu and so on. And he has a personal hate to his society. You need to have such kind of a psychological psychopath person to lead this. this. Then you bring all these young people, you indoctrinate them. What they did, it was in Hurso. They brought them in Hurso, they trained them, and they unleashed them like a biting dog. But one thing I will tell you, the more one day that these Liu police, they are children, and of course they, are, they came from that society. Suppose one day their consciousness increases, and they understand what they are doing is wrong, and that is they are being used by the external forces. What Wayane will have the day they will defect it? That Wayane have never calculated it. That's what happened to the commandees in Eritrea. Finally, when they, their consciousness was, 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 was rise, they have joined the movement and they have fought for their independence. And this possibility is there. You use people, you might, they might be ignorant for the moment, but after tomorrow, they might raise their consciousness and they can turn against you. After all, they are Somalis. They are not Tigrayans who are fighting there. And this calculation, you have to put it there. If there will be a democratic revolutionary movement there and try to infiltrate them and raise their consciousness, then they will know. They might defect one day. Wayana is playing, uh, playing for the moment is in the upper hand, but the, uh, and using them now against the Oromo people, which is, means that it is to put a stone in the shoes of the Oromo uh, uprise. That is the purpose of the... But the killing, the level of the killing, it is you can't imagine. All these organizations have mentioned, but including Human Rights Watch and so on. But the man is going to the United States. He visits the United States. It's called the democratic country. He comes to the UK. They subsidize him. All these organizations, they have printed all this uh, crime, but they don't do anything. Dr. Maori, can I just can I just clarify very quickly one point? Who do you think created Liu Police? You said the British funded it, the British trained it. Yes. So as far as training and funding is concerned, let's say that the British are behind it. There might be yes. other forces, but it is widely reported that the British government did fund uh, the training of Liu Police. Yes. But who who made the decision to create this kind of force? It is the center, the federal, the federal government, the region, or TPLF, TPLF made that decision? TPLF, uh, one thing I would like to clarify for you. This is not clear for a lot of Ethiopians in general. TPLF, 75% of the Ethiopian army, now they are removing it, bringing them to the to, 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 to Oromo area. 75,000, 75% of them, they are at the border with Eritrea from Bure until up. Behind the, this army, to control this army, in case if they defect or they wanted to go to their villages, they have created Tigrayan militias. 100,000 Tigrayan militias were created in order to protect the soldier not to defect from the front line. They also created about 145,000 through the Amhara organization, 145,000 militia controlling every single Amhara village in Amhara area. What they didn't succeed to do that, which OPDO didn't succeed eh, to create such kind of militia in the Oromo area. And when the Oromo uprise happened, as you know, the nearest, the closest segment of the early warning system of a government is the police. The police is known by the, by the people. He is from there. He is the closest to the population. And he is the one 
who collects information and he send it up. The police in the Oromo area have collapsed because they are also Oromos and they have their consciousness have raised. That is why they have to do the emergency and the, what they call this in a special type of regime and so and so on. But immediately after they removed it, the Oromo people again revolted, as we have seen the, uh, this week. It gives the nature and the policy of the central government of the TPLF. It had felt when the Kairos asked that they decided and all Oromo people have accepted and remained at home. So we have to know the magnitude of the anger, the revolutionary aspiration of the Oromo people. The Liu police will be used in order to canalize the anger toward the Somalis. That is not possible. The consciousness of Oromos is very high. One thing to correct you, those who are putting in the social media, there is a conspiracy of greater Somalia. Those who are putting is the intelligence service of Wayane in order to divert the use of Oromos not to do their real homework are supposed to, to they are doing it now. So we have to be very okay. careful with that. Um, th th thanks for that. Um, Professor Mohammed. Um, so uh, there are different views uh, around um, the creation of the Liu police. Uh, some say that it was initially created uh, to deal with uh, intra-Somali problem, particularly with the problem of Ogaden, and then uh, it was um, expanded, strengthened, and used uh, for other purposes, including uh, the conflict in Romia and also uh, in Somalia itself. Um, my question to you is, uh, to what extent do you agree with the view that from the very beginning, the TPLF envisioned the possibility of using Liu police beyond the Somali regional states? Uh, I think that is a very good... Uh, the question is directed to me? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Um, before I mention the second part of your question about envisioning, uh, from my limited reading, and there is a very limited literature on EU policy because the TPLF cont tightly controls movement in the Somali regional state, probably more than any other areas, and therefore accurate information is very difficult. But from my limited reading, uh, remember in April 2007, the Ogaden, the ONLF really undertook a very impressive attack on the Chinese run oil field, killing, if I correctly remember the figure, 70 uh, Chinese and the TPLF military and uh, civilian personnel, and with a single blow. They actually, the ONLF attack crushed the dream of the TPLF leaders for using the oil, uh, natural resources of Ogaden, the, the oil. Basically, after that, they could not simply continue with that project. And uh, if, I'm, if, again, my reading is accurate, Marles was really angry with that. And he definitely unleashed what is a scorched earth policy, which is well documented, where probably between 83 and 101 villages were burned to the ground, men and women. They denied the people access to water and food, basically punishing them by slow, cruel deaths. Once that news was leaked out, Marles, being what he was, he wanted to mitigate the out international outcry about the genocide that was really going on in Ogaden, and he came up with the idea of Liu police, and it was created for the purpose of hunting down ONLF members and its supporters. And they have continued with that role. Uh, if, again, my reading is accurate, probably it was in 2014, they uh, rapidly expanded it and then extended 
Leon Polis as a fighting arm of a TPLF force in uh, Somalia itself, fighting against Al Shabaab. And then they started using uh, in Oromia itself. In, in a word, it looks very clearly that the creation of Liu Police was really the, uh, the work of the late Prime Minister Malas Zainawi. And his goal was to destroy, if possible, the ONLF, basically. And... Uh, 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 definitely, the, the Liu Police caused incredible uh, destruction in the Somali regional state itself. Remember, a day will come when this history will be written, uh, uh, and the road played there and then in other areas will become much clearer. Thank you so much. Um, any one of you can answer this question. It's a, it's a general question, but I just wanted to get some clarity on this. Um, it, it concerns the clan dynamics within Somali, within the, the, the Somali regional state. Um, from what I understand, uh, the Ogadenis are the most politically dominant uh, forces within the Somali regional state, uh, both in government, but also outside the government. Um, you can't be politically dominant outside the government, but at least one of the most rebellious forces, which includes the Ogaden National Liberation Front. Uh, to what extent is uh, clan differences, clan dynamics at sub-clan level plays a role in terms of uh, providing, for example, support to the EU police or the president of the region? Um, Dr. Dr. Mohammed in Belgium probably uh, you might be best suited to respond to this question. I think uh, there is a misunderstanding for uh, uh, Ethiopians who are not Somalis uh, uh, on this issue because uh, their understanding is very shallow and it's not very deep. First of all, uh, uh, the Somali area in Ethiopia, all Somali clans uh, uh, even those uh, more than Somalia, they live there. The Ogadenis are not also majority, as you have said. They only constitute 33 percent. The issue ONLF, ONLF is created because the young people who had been in the Western Somali Liberation Front, and they have seen that it is the Western Somali Liberation Front, the elderly generation which was ruling it, they are not responding to the aspiration and the feeling of the young people. And later on, through their own discussions, they finally, they said that Western Somali Liberation Front, it have another connotation. And it is the international community sees it that it is as an, as an expansionist policy of Somalia. We have to design another type of organization. And from that perspective, they have taken the ONLF Ogaden National Liberation Front. But <laughs> you are the org once they did that and they start their struggle, ONLF is not liberating the international community. You liberate the Somalis in that area. The moment you say you are ONLF Ogaden National Liberation Front, the non Ogadeni Somalis will reject you. So automatically you shrink to a very small group. That was a strategical mistake. I find it from the ONLF uh, side. But despite of that, the ONLF had fought seriously. It had protected the resources of the region, as Professor Mohammed said. And this low intensity war, which is engineered by, by Zainawi in order to loot the resources of that area, it angered him. There was a contract was given for the Chinese. You know that in the world now, the resources grabbing. And then after that also they have given through the Ministry of Mining they have given also contract to the Malaysians and they wanted to loot that and they wanted to make big money and, and, and that money from this area will be transformed to them and they might build their own so-called uh, bigger Tigray. But the ONLF, it have stopped them. And it have stopped them because they took an army uh, in the region. One thing we have to be very clear until today, Ethiopia have no national army until today. It have a militia. The country is ruled by, there is no national army. National army in normal circumstance, 
they come from the different nationalities, from different groups, from different families, and they join the national army. The Ethiopian national army is a caste system, like the Indian caste system. You have all the officers and the commanding in class, only are Tigrayans. You know that it is, there is only three, dif- three or four other generals, or Oromo and Amhara, and one Agaw, all the other generals and the officers, the colonels and so on, are Tigrayans. So you have a caste system, officers, and all are controlling the army. Those who are carrying the gun, the Amharas, Oromos, and others, literally they are the slaves of TPLF, who have died also in the war of Eritrea. So the inside, in the, in the Somali area, I'm sorry, let me finish. In the Somali area, the army could not fight and could not stop the, expand, uh, the expanding uh, role of the ONLF. So th- they have to envisage another strategy, and this strategy is the low intensity war, but a low intensity war with a package of genocide and elimination, all villages and so and so on. And history will tell. One thing here I want to conclude. The previous Ethiopian regimes, whether of Haile Selassie, of, Mar- of Mangistu, they have never committed to this magnitude a crime in that part of the world, in that part uh, of the Somali area. But this okay, one, my- have committed, yes. These are all very useful, I think, points. But my question is, to what extent did intra-Ogadenic clan dynamics, not just at the, at the, at the level of Ogaden, but um, at the sub-clan level, to what extent did that play a role in terms of enhancing and strengthening the U police and the Abdi-Ile government? That, that was my question. Yeah, let me, uh, you know, uh, in a family can, can there is... Very briefly, yes. please. In a family, there might be one tall and one short and one lighter skin and one darker skin. You can plan for them in order to let them fight among themselves. Low intensity war, it's a creation. There is a dynamic among themselves. The Somalis, they might have an uh, uh, of a clan contradiction, but at the same time, they marry, uh, they marry among themselves and they are cousins and relatives. You cannot break this kind of relationship very easily. What you do is that you use that. Cont- there is, if there is no contradiction, means there will never be Somalis. Or if our, Muhammad can only, I can only live eh, while I'm alive, there will be contradiction. When I die, I don't speak. There is no contradiction. In society also is the same like that. What they did is that they have used this man and they have both in the name of clan. They incited the clan and they brought the Liu police, and these are illiterate people who have been brought in, inculcated, and so on. They did it, as I told you, in Eritrea. They did it in the Philippines. They did it in a lot of other places. Low-intensity war or a counter-insurgency, it is not new for, for, for that part. And it is not the clan contradiction which have contributed. It is the state which is very strong. It have money, it bought, and it brought also these people and train them and indoctrinate them. It is the movement's mistake, if you wanted to tell me, they should have infiltrated this Liu police, educate them gradually, and bring them to that. That is the quality of a, of, of a democratic movement. If you don't do that, the same what's happening in Oromia. They will try also to create that, but we have to be very aware that it is we have to educate our young people and show them the target. Everywhere the enemy will have a loophole. That is not the clan contradiction. It is they can use our weakness against us. Thank you very much. Um, Abadir, I want to come to you. Uh, one of the sort of change that are taking place within the Liu police is, is the fact that it is transforming from sort of paramilitary force into uh, some type of economic uh, military hall. Right, that engage not only in military activities but also uh, in economic activities, uh, almost like the Egyptian military or the Ethiopian military. Uh, to what extent does this changing dimension of the EU police uh, would continue to have uh, the kind of impact it is having now? Would it be a positive impact, a negative impact? What would be the implication of that, you think? Uh, well, here's the thing. Um, when I think about the EU police, the, the thing I cannot place my finger on is uh, part, part of the reason I can't place my finger on that 
group is um, how fast it has evolved and you know how different it is now, how different the activities now are you know compared to uh, when it uh, when it was formed. Um, when you talk about and the economic um, aspect of the Eupolis and the 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 inter tribal and ethnic aspect of the Eupolis, uh, which you mentioned earlier. One thing I would like to say about that is that um, the Eupolis is not uh, necessarily a militia that's raised from the people in, in the sense of, for example, uh, the, the Janjaweed, for example, where you have local economic uh, clan, ethnic, linguistic features, and you militarize those features and, you know, you turn them into conflict. That, that's not what took place uh, with the Liu police. Um, it is uh, trained, uh, and, and I would say highly trained, a very young force, um, and I would assume probably also uh, salaried. Um, th- that makes it different, that makes it unique in that it doesn't need uh, to go on uh, cattle raiding in order to sustain itself. Um, which makes it interesting when, when the Liu police comes, comes into Oromia, um, do you see it as a, mili- as a military unit or as a militia that is raiding into a, a different region? So it, it's really difficult to, um, to describe it as a clan-based grouping uh, because it's, it's, you know, it's not economically based on the land. It's mm. economically based uh, on the relationship it has with the state. Um, so th- that's an interesting question to which, you know, it's difficult to place a finger on that. It's difficult uh, to characterize, to compare them with Egypt in the, in the sense of uh, seeing them as a, you know, military industrial complex because they, they are really, really, really small, um, uh, you know, if both economically and militarily. They're, they, they're, they're not even a mechanized, uh, heavily armed, you know, artillery uh, armed kind of uh, army unit. So it's difficult to compare them uh, with Egypt. It's also different to compare them with, you know, ethnic based groups like the Janjaweed or economically based groups as, you know, nomadic groups that are uh, armed in order to uh, go after different ethnicities and things like that. So it's, I think it's really difficult to put a finger on that as no, it's it, it's certainly not the Egyptian military or the Ethiopian military for that matter. It's a very small regionally based uh, paramilitary force, but it is transforming itself at an alarming rate. Uh, it's not just increasing it in terms of its membership, but also in terms of its activities. So some of the economic activities, for example, that is involved in currently include housing development agency, um, uh, water work construction, or construction and procurement of uh, special uh, police enterprise. Um, and as we talked extensively already, uh, the the regional president is the former uh, chief of this uh, this force. Uh, there is a very close uh, connection and relationship between the force and uh, the regional government, and of course also a very close connection between. Uh, some of the key economic players at the center that are also um, uh, important forces within the security arrangement. And I think it's very important to sort of have uh, um, an understanding of how all these things play out um, as, as we go forward, uh, given before, this. Before I uh, come, you know, before I'm able to um, answer that question in any intelligible way, um, I, I, I wonder how much um, it is it, its role in, in uh, development are uh, I, I'm thinking you know you're we're talking about the, this military force replacing the neopatrimonial political system uh, political party system that exists in the region. Not so it is not saying, about- and not about replacing it, rather transforming it and in some ways enhancing it. Uh, because when you have a security and economic uh, arrangement, 
in which the, the center that is in charge of the country uses a geographically peripheral community and a force that is based within that community to advance not only economic interest, but also political interest, a political interest that allows it to secure itself and consolidate its power. I think there is something politically significant here. May I say um, something? May I say something on this? Uh, let, let, let me give uh, Abadi a chance and you will come in. Um, okay, Abadir, yeah, let, me let, let me quickly end uh, this by saying, you know, the question I'm, I was wondering how much it replaces the uh, the political uh, organization is because um, it, you know it looks like that the, it looks like the center is trying to replace the political mechanism with the security mechanism because they, they're going to have a finite amount of uh, fin financing they can send to the region. So the question becomes one of um, are they trying to shift those uh, institutions to the Liu police, therefore uh, making the Liu police, you know, controlling the Liu police uh, or incorporating it into the new patrimonial state rather than just keeping it as a separate military unit. You know, that's that's the angle I was uh, looking at it from, um, which also raises the question of does the center see the Liu police as a permanent establishment that is going to control uh, via its investments so that it can start using it to exploit the natural resources that um, it hasn't been able to exploit so far because of uh, the insurgency. So I, I'll end with that and, and maybe uh, you can get, uh, give the podium to... Uh, Dr. Dr. Mohammed, you can come in now. First of all, it is the, the function of the region uh, uh, since this Abdul arrival, the Somali region have never used it is uh, uh, legitimate budget. The budget of the Somali region, it was fattening the Tigrayan generals and officers there. Now, since 1991, since the so-called federal government, that region have played three important roles. One, contraband. The Tigrayan business people, they bring goods through Barbara and from other ports, and it passes in the name of the army, including laptop, soft papers, and brought in into Addis, and they are competing eh, illegally, and they don't pay even tax. And this way that they have accumulated their wealth. Secondly, that it is the region by itself, it is the, be the best place where Tigrayan colonels and generals, they can accumulate wealth. Thirdly, this is the region which have never used it as budget. It is budget was, was taken by the generals and the colonels and the intelligence. Now, what is the role of Liu police in Abdu Ili? Recently in Bordeaux Day, a young man which is working for, for, for the region. He could not use the region car because of the uprise of the Oromos. And he was taking public transportation and he was captured by Oromo police with $570,000 and some, some, some Ethiopian bill. This is the money which is exported from Addis. One thing we have to know that Abdi Ili, the so-called president, he is also he is laundering the money for the Tigrayans who have looted Ethiopia, and they bring that money through there. And at the border, there is a very small village called Togochali. There, there is a bank, the Habshil Bank, Hawala. From there, they are exporting their wells, and this money they have looted to Dubai. So the region is the best place where they can, yeah, it's very difficult now that it is, you use a banking system, they are frightened themselves, and they are using this way for the last 26 years. So the Liu police is a private militia of this man and the intelligence in, in that region and the generals and the coronels. That is the role of the Liu police. But did they have any industrial structure? It's not true. 
I told you that the budget of the region even, nobody knows where it's going on. There is no any, these fake development programs, there have been water resources and all, that, they are in paper, in reality, majority of the population, they are suffering, there is no water, there is around the Jigjiga only, there is about seven prisons, seven prisons. Huh? And one of them, the worst one was Jail Ogaden. Apart from that, there was a Tigrayan journalist who had been arrested and he's now long, uh, in, in the prison of Ziwai. He wrote an article from there saying that a lot of Somalis who have been imprisoned here and nobody brought them to court. They are just languishing on that prisons. 35% of the prisoners in Ethiopia are Somalis. After that, they are Oromos. So there is nothing. It is, is a looting zone, a killing zone. And this man is really a criminal. And there is no, as I agree with Abader, they are not like Janjaweed who had an economic interest or, or uh, b between the pastoralists and, 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 and the farmers, the sedentary and so on. These are pure mafia system gangs organized, led by them, by this man. How, how do we understand the claim that it is not merely a militia force? that it runs a number of enterprises and organizations uh, that build roads, houses, uh, and provides other services. How, how, there are claims, and I have I've raised this in several uh, places uh, in the past and also while preparing for this program. Are you saying that they are not engaged in this, or um, are you saying that um, um, the Somali population has never benefited from uh, their development activities, which are two separate things, in my view. There is no development. This is this is white elephant. They are only the existing paper, not in reality. I have all the. Do they, do they do they run? Do they have they, they, the, some of them? They, they only exist in paper. Do they, they don't they, exist do they, in reality? Do they, for to give, example, to give you an example, the one who who, who was captured in Bordeaux, he is he is. <laughs> he, he, he is working for an organization with a Somali region organization for development and rehabilitation of the Somali area. Huh? But he is a carrier. He's taking all his job is that it is to come to Addis, collect the money and bring it to, to, to Jigjiga and from Jigjiga to, to, to the border and put it to the bank and it goes over to the bank. That is his task. But the tag they gave to him, we should not believe the tag they gave to him. He have an identity card. If you go in the Facebook, you will see his identity card and his job description, it is written there. But he's, he's just only uh, uh, transporting money from Addis to there. All of them, it is fake. Very few groups, yes, they use the budget and he is, I mean, Abdi Ile, he is distributing for them and buying them, you know, like this clientelism among themselves. But for the population, there is nothing. Most of them, they are a refugee camp in Dabab. You have to go there and you could make them interview. In fact, the BBC uh, uh, Channel 4, two years ago, had shown one hour interview and then it made uh, a news night concerning this in the Kenya refugee camps. Uh, Dr. Awal, may, may I add a footnote? Yes, yes, I, I, was, I was about to come to you. Please go ahead. Okay. When the... Uh, brutality of Liu police was exposed and reported in the British press. Uh, you may not believe, but this is something that is written. Actually, Bill Gates, don't ask me the connection, Bill Gates uh, wrote an article in the British papers supporting the activities they do, uh, the Liu police do. Basically, the attempt to say they are involved in social improvement, they are building infrastructure, they are doing these good things for the people, schools, hospitals, these are simply to cover. It, it is a propaganda. Essentially, it is really a propaganda for improving the the image of Liu Polis. In reality, I am not sure if they really do anything. You know, my knowledge is limited. And if I may add just a footnote to what uh, Dr. Muhammad said, in terms of the budget of Ogaden, 
not only the budget of Ogaden, one of the previous president of Oromea, this was in the 1990s, he once told me they were required to return one third of the budget of Oromea, my friend. It was basically only one region in Ethiopia, the Tigray, is capable of consuming its, you know, uh, implementing, using it is on budget, others are required to return a certain amount, and that money will directly go to uh, Tigray. And in those days, it was in the name of developing, of course, uh, building up Tigray from the war, the damage of the war, and so on. I just wanted to clarify this point. I think the, the, the argument that Leopolis is expanding into the economic sector it was it was not meant to say that it is bringing development uh, to areas that were uh, deprived it, it wasn't just about that maybe the government and the regional government might spin it in those terms but there is this danger that when a particular paramilitary force uh, have an important role in the economy of a particular region, and that links up not just in the works in terms of the relationship between the region and that force, but also with the security forces built in the center that have an interest in terms of maintaining this force and maybe allowing this force to engage in some economic activities. Right? The fact that it is able to pay itself, the fact that it can recruit as many members from its, the clan, from the region, also including from diaspora, by the way. I think the fact that it can do that because of the financial resources that it has uh, is something independent of the kind of claim uh, to which uh, I think uh, Professor Mohammed and, and also partly um, uh, Dr. Mohammed referred to, which is the claim that it is engaged in uh, providing uh, basic social services to local population. I think there is another danger, which is no less insidious uh, in my view. Um, I am going to conclude, but I have one last question that I want to put to all of you, which is, um, I think a point which is already mentioned uh, by uh, a couple of people, by Abadir and Dr. Mohammed, which is to do with uh, the question of accountability. Why is it that um, Abdi Ile, uh, someone who have overseen um, um, a huge uh, amount of massive and grave violations of human rights, uh, someone that is accused of um, um, overseeing a force uh, responsible for um, war crimes, crimes against humanity, why was he able to travel to European cities, the US, and nobody really cared or worried about trying to hold this individual accountable. What was the problem? Is this the international community not caring about events that happen in the global south? Or is it because uh, societies that were directly affected, whereas the Somalis and the Oromos have not done enough in terms of creating uh, a viable environment for accountability? Abadi, if I may start with you. Um, well, I, I think it's more about, you know, from the point of view of the government for uh, welcoming him, um, I think they don't have the incentive uh, or the pressure that's bearing on them in order to force them to do something. Um, it, it might not even be uh, prosecuting for crimes. It, it might be uninviting someone. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's the one aspect.